Hi, I'm Dan Hammermesh. I'm Network Director at the IZA and Editor-in-Chief of the IZA World of Labor. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce this set of interviews I had over the past week with leading labor scholars in several different countries. Uh, all of them have thought about the coronavirus crisis, the effect on labor markets, effects on the economy. And I just want to chat with them and get a perspective. The interesting thing is the countries covered have had vastly different experiences in terms of how they've managed the crisis, the extent to which uh, cases have occurred, deaths have occurred. I thought it'd be really interesting to have this kind of uh, comparative set of interviews going on. The set of interviews was put together by the co-producers, Theodora Ruseva and Olga Notmeyer, and the script was mostly written by Theodora herself. So I hope you enjoy this, and I think it's just really fascinating to look at how different things are across the different markets. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, Andreas. It's a pleasure to have here today Andreas Peichel, who is professor at what I call University of Munich and also a program director at the SESI FO in Munich. And he probably is, well, unquestionably is the leading expert on inequality in Germany, as well as a distinguished researcher worldwide. What I want to do, Andreas, is just ask you a few questions about the COVID and its economics and labor market aspects of it. First question is, you're very familiar with policy in Germany. I wonder how effective you think the policies have been in mitigating the economic effects of COVID and what policies do you think have or has been the most effective? Yeah, good afternoon, Dan. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's uh, in terms of policy responses in Germany, I don't think there's one single policy in general um, to single out in the for the COVID response, but in general for economic recessions, the short-time working scheme, the Kurzarbeitergeld that we have in place, I think it's the most important one because it works in some sense as an automatic stabilizer. So there's not much discretionary need for policymakers to make decisions, but it's really it's in place uh, when the firms uh, are in a bad situation, they can put these uh, their workers on this temp kind of temporary unemployment insurance system, uh, in, mostly in part time. So while keeping them still working in their firm, and this is usually uh, seen as a very beneficial uh, policy tool. Question on that, though. I mean, it keeps them working in the firm, but if firms are locked down as they have been the past two months, what do the people actually do? They aren't professors who can work from home. What do they do with their time? So in uh, in, in Germany, in, we didn't have a lockdown of many firms. Um, so it, it was just in the... The, uh, the restaurants, hotels that were shut down by by law, but some of some big uh, manufacturing firms decided to do a, a, their own lockdown and to shut down production, mostly in the car industry. But most of the firms who were allowed to continue producing, and we were, uh -huh. it was the policy responses in Germany were also different than in other countries. So there was. We were recommended to stay at home, but we could uh, still go to work every day. And uh, also the University of Munich, for example, wasn't shut down. So we, we could go to our offices and to work there. We were just yeah. told we should better stay home and not use public transportation. But we, I could go to still go to the office every day, So, uh, which I didn't do for, for various reasons. But uh I think that that was also what's different in Germany in the policy re response in Germany to, to other countries, especially to Italy or France, where it was really a, 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 a severe or strict lockdown. Very interesting indeed. Okay, as the leading expert on inequality, how do you think the crisis has affected inequality in Germany? Oh, it, it's it's very hard to tell because obviously we are lacking the, the data for this, but there are a few guesses that you can make. So the first thing is that it probably has a short term effect reducing wealth inequality because asset prices went down and uh, for some ex parts. And then uh, also we expect that some assets won't grow as fast in the future in the real estate market. That's something what you could guess. but. Uh, we've already seen that the stock market uh, 
is going up a lot again. And uh, it's also we've seen that some people who had cash started to invest and to buy some assets. So I think in the in the in the medium to long term, it will actually increase wealth inequality. Um, in terms of income and earnings inequality, we we see that um, the people who are mostly affected by this short time working scheme um, in previous recessions, this was very much concentrated to manufacturing. So people in, in the Great Recession who were in this program and lost some income um, were mostly from manufacturing, well paid manufacturing jobs. This is different this time because of the lockdown of, of certain service industries and especially what we would call social consumption. And this is typically low skilled, low paid jobs. And so because of this, we should see an increase in, in, in wage and in earnings inequality. And with this, then also income inequality, because the, the tax benefit system can only cushion some of these income losses. So, so um, presumably also. Presumably no, sorry, also I, I was, then, right. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry, I was also, saying so the totally. Oh, sorry, if there's a delay. Now you go. Okay. Presumably also this especially hits immigrants. Is that correct or am I missing something? No, it's, it's, it's correct. So it's, it's, let's say, what we would call more vulnerable groups. So it won't be uh, old white males uh, that, that will be affected the most, but uh, it will be uh, immigrants, it will be uh, more women, and it will also be uh, younger people who are uh, hit the most. One of the biggest problems, and this is a personal problem for me, since one of my grandchildren graduated university and is cannot find a job. What about people graduating secondary school or universities in this crisis? Are they having particular problems or is the overall cushioning cushion them, too, in some way? Um, so it's uh, most of the in Germany, we are a bit behind in terms of the academic year. So most graduation uh -huh. is only coming in the summer. And uh -huh. so the, the, the job market for graduates usually starts in September or it's, uh, the, the new jobs start in September. So we we don't know exactly how it will look like and um, how the, the outlook will be over the next uh, weeks and months certainly will have an impact there. But um I'm sure we can expect that um, that there will be effects, but um, it's uh, I think so far the evidence is uh, or what we see is actually mixed uh, because we had um, in the past in certain industries a shortage of skilled labor in Germany. Uh, we see actually see that some firms are very aggressively hiring people now. They try to recruit talents that they couldn't get in the past because, for example, the, the big automobile companies were attracting a lot of talents and they are currently in, in, a, rel in a crisis, so they stopped hiring. But now mm -hmm. other firms uh, t uh, that, need, that, were, that couldn't pay as much as the, the big car companies, they are now trying to aggressively hire people. So it's, uh, it's an interesting situation and we don't have very good data on this, only anecdotal evidence or we see some job ads like this. And so... I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the data and to, to see what's actually <laughs> happening. We're always looking forward to seeing more data. Uh, let me ask you this. I guess not all the schools have been locked down, but presumably there has been some online learning going on, right? Online yeah, so teaching. Actually, yeah, most schools were actually shut down. Um, most schools and, and childcare for, for toddlers. And uh, so <laughs> they, and they are still, right now we are uh, in June, they think that about 50% of children can go back to, to some form of, of schooling. So it, how do it you, will take some while. How do you think this has affected schooling and the imparting of knowledge and education so far? So I think it's in, I mean, the lockdown or the shutdown so far was for two months. Um, and I think we, we will see some, uh, some effects, uh, on educational outcomes and then educational inequalities. Because in general, the, in Germany, the, the education system, um, is, uh, it's, it very much depends on your parental background already. And we, we see that now with, uh, with uh, schools locked down and uh, kids have to stay at home, it's it's especially uh, richer parents who can more easily afford to spend time with their children. So if, if both partners work and one spouse takes care of the kids, uh, that that's uh, 
be they are doable then for uh, poorer households where both actually have to uh, uh, to work to earn a living and so and then of also the the gradient the possibility of teaching your kids at home uh, is also depends on your your own education i guess and so it's I assume that uh, the kids from from let's say good parental background they they do well, whereas those from poorer parental backgrounds they don't don't do very well. And in terms of you mentioned online teaching, that's something where we are lacking behind a lot in Germany. Um, so it, uh, in in general, we in terms of digitization, we are more like a developing country in in many areas. Uh, we are, we are uh, this this crisis and if it has something good then it's an increased uh, speed of digitization of germany so but um and i'm i'm learning from 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 people that i know that uh, schools suddenly start to think about online teaching and or maybe even have a zoom meeting uh, with their with their students and stuff like that but that's starting to come it's not there it wasn't there in march for for most of the schools huh. And that so, is fascinating. Uh, since I'd assume that Germany would be ahead of most places, but in fact, that sounds far behind even the United States, which I find surprising. Yeah, and in, in, the, in so that respect. Had, go ahead. No, sorry, I was going to say in terms of digitization, technic, use of technology, we are we are far behind and. I mean, if you may, you might remember from your visits to Germany that we love uh, cash still in the economy to to pay more transactions. But all of the sudden, we can pay, can go to a bakery and buy something for one euro and pay with a credit card. So I think this is uh, in, in in this sense the, the the crisis can also have some positive effects. <laughs> I'm glad something good is coming out of it. And your discussion of the parents at home educating the kids leads to another question. There's been a recent pair of studies in the UK talking about how husbands and wives or men and women's time in childcare has changed in the crisis. Okay. Germany is pretty well known for doing much more women doing much more homework than men compared even to other rich countries, except Italy, which is by far the champion of women doing all the work in Europe. I wonder how this has changed in the crisis. Has there been an increasing equalization of child care and home production by spouses, or is it still women doing almost everything? Uh, it, it, again, the, the data is, uh, is not very good on this, but from what, what I've uh, seen is that it's uh, the opposite. So it's really the women taking on more responsibilities and spending more time at home, even more and, than before, and uh, having a much higher uh, load in terms of household duties. And so it, it's not good in, in, in terms of equalizing uh, gender roles in Germany. Huh. But the guys can't go out to the uh, Kneipen drinking anymore. There's no Kneipen open, right? So what are the men doing? You can drink via Zoom with your buddies. I mean, it's not the same <laughs> thing, but <laughs> no. And, uh, so the, and, and now we've, we've reopened the Kneipen, the beer gardens, they are open again. But it was also that the, the, the men, as I said, the men could go out for work. So you could... Actually, you couldn't drink in a, in, a, in, in a beer garden, but you could go stay in the office longer and have a beer there with your colleagues. So, uh, I mean, of course, keeping the, of course. the social distance and so on. But yes. uh, it seems that this is that, that this is what's happening, at least on average, that uh, women were taking on more responsibilities. It seems like the major difference then between uh, Germany and then certainly the U.S. and even Sweden, uh, which I've talked to somebody from Sweden, is that but Sweden didn't do a lockdown, but it did an awful lot of social distancing. You've done some lockdown. The U.S. has done a tremendous lockdown, as you know, and I think that conditions things much more than anybody else, the extent to which people, men especially, can't go to their workplaces. Germany seems really unusual in this regard. Do you think there's any comparable country you know of to Germany in this, or is it completely unique in your view? No, I think it's uh, 
I mean, the, in, in Germany, we were looking pretty much uh, to Italy and saw what Italy did. And then uh, the next country was Austria. So Italy was usually two weeks ahead of us. And Austria one week, and so we 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 sort of learned from these two experiences, and we decided to be, let's say, to follow a bit more the Austrian way and not be as strict in in several dimensions as Italy was. But obviously, also the the, the crisis in terms of infection rates in Italy was much higher to begin with. So the good thing was that that we were kind of importing uh, our our. Corona cases from first from Italy and then from Austria, and so we could learn also what what would be the best responses. And we were, I guess, a few weeks, a few days faster than these countries and with certain measures, and that helped also to to keep the infection rates and especially the death rates low. Together with uh, having uh, doing much more testing very early and uh, also trying to track and isolate uh, people who were infected much quicker. I mean, it really is a tremendous success story. Just looking right now on my phone at the number of deaths per million in Germany, it's 102 deaths per million compared to the United States, which is, what are we? We are 300 deaths per million and rising rapidly. And of course, the champion is Belgium with over 800, as you know. Why have you done so well? That's my final question. What is it that you think you can attribute this to? So there, there are two reasons, I think. I think the first is that indeed we, we had some a bit more time to prepare than some of the neighboring countries because we were closely monitoring the situation in Italy and, and uh, Austria and were a bit quicker in, in uh, having some measures then. The next thing is that the German healthcare system was in a better situation than those of neighboring countries. So I think we had per capita something like two or three times the, the capacity of uh, intensive care uh, unit beds than all the other, the average and all the other countries in Europe. And so we were as one measure of the healthcare system. So we were prepared for this a bit better. And yeah. we, we did a lot, a lot of testing and tracing contacts right from the start. So we, the first outbreak in, in Germany was in January, and uh, basically it, it was very quickly contained. Uh, it was actually close to Munich. Uh, someone who came back from China was infected, and then I think in total okay. 11 others uh, were also infected, and 200 people put on quarantine, and then this was, this infection chain was stopped. So I... The issue then in, in March was that didn't work because we were importing um, this from Austria and Italy, people that went skiing in, in the ski, during the skiing uh. holidays in February. And this was then spreading like in many other European countries um, right quickly. But the good thing there was is that the people who went skiing, they are on average younger and healthier than, than the average population. So it, it was at first it was affecting a lot of young and healthy people. And then in contrast to Italy, uh, the household sizes are much more smaller and we have much less multi-generational households in, in Germany. So uh, we have very few grandparents living together with, uh, with children. And this obviously also uh, stops the, the infection chains. And that was, I think, one of the reasons why Italy was hit so hard. Because if you have many, and Italy has the highest share of multi-generation households in Europe. And so this, I think, so it's, it's not one explanation, but several. In, uh, I think we were, on the one hand, we were lucky. And on the other hand, we, we did a good job in, in some respect. We could have still acted quicker. Very good. Well, it is a success story. Anyway, Andreas, look, thank you for joining me today. This has been a real pleasure. and. Uh, I think the German perspective is fascinating. I just wish I could be there to share it with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan. Thanks.